from ABC. This is the 10% Happier Podcast. I'm Dan Harris. Close listeners will recall that uh, toward the uh, end of last year, I believe, or at the beginning of this year, I don't know, one of those two, um, we did an, uh, a first time I was kind of inveigled into doing this experiment, uh, inveigled by my uh, producers, uh, Lauren and Josh, uh, a call-in show where we set up a number that you can call and leave a voicemail and ask me anything you want. So uh, I didn't know if that was, was, this was going to be a, a, a really stupid idea or something pretty cool. Turned out to be the latter. Uh, I love doing it. The questions were great. So now we're going to try every week to take a question or two at the top of every show. So here we go. Let's uh, in, in a minute. I'll give you the number if you want to call in. But uh, let's uh, let's take question number one. Hey Dan, my name is Peter. I uh, began listening to your podcast, and I'm listening to your app, um, and I'm already finding six days or so in to meditating in the way that your app is teaching me to feel different. But I wonder if it's a placebo effect or if I'll have a an equal downward uh, spiral for a while. I've tried meditation before, haven't gotten it. This seems to be taking because I haven't done it every day, but I've been more faithful to this than I have been anything else, and I'm feeling the benefits. So I wonder, is this what I can continue to expect? So uh, I'm going to issue the caveat that um, I always do, and I think it's important to do, which is that I'm not a meditation teacher. Um, I'm just a fellow meditator um, who's written a few books on the subject, so I'm not like a complete um, uh, moron, but um, close to it. So having said that, uh, I think that, um, first of all, what you're describing sounds great, and congratulations. Uh, and, you know, meditation does, in my experience, have benefits, and they are what you describe, which is that you uh, are boosting uh, your ability to focus and pay attention, and you're boosting your ability to be mindful. In other words, to be non judgmentally aware of whatever's happening in your head so that it doesn't yank you around. And um, uh, so, so that what you're describing doesn't sound to me otherworldly, unrealistic, you know, metaphysical, any, anything um, uh, that, that is ultimately unreliable. Uh, that being said, um, it's not uncommon for me also to hear from people who get very excited at the beginning of a meditation practice and... And for one reason or another, fall off, either because they somehow, you know, life intervenes and uh, they uh, just l stop practicing for a couple of days and then their ego slips in and tells them that they're a failed meditator and and uh, then they just stop doing it for months. Or because, you know, um, brain chemistry and exogenous events conspire to uh, diminish your the perceived benefits and... Uh, and you lose some confidence. Um, so it, both of these things can be true simultaneously. And so what I would say is, it, just from my own experience as somebody who's practiced now for about nine years, um, that uh, it comes and goes. And it's dependent on a whole bunch of variables. And so the quality of your practice and the quality of your practice as it shows up in the rest of your life can really fluctuate. And um, part of what you're training yourself to do in practice is to roll with these all these ups and downs in a more supple way and, um, and, and not to get too hung up on how, what, you know, what the quality of your last sit was or what the quality of your last week was um, and t tie that to, you know, the overall uh, utility and quality of your of your practice. Uh, so o over time, I think you just get used to the fact that uh, meditation is is not about, you know, in, in the act of meditation itself, it's not about feeling a certain way. It's about feeling whatever you feel clearly. And in your life, it's not about, you know, achieving sort of some permanent state of uh, improved focus and mindfulness. It's it's about a, a, a an improved baseline, but it's going to fluctuate based on conditions. That's my experience. Uh, great question. Let's do uh, let's do one more. Hi Dan, this is Jay Collins from Brooklyn. My question for you is: Can the act of interrupting and noting a natural thought process 
potentially interrupt a good thought from fully blossoming. For example, if an inventor has a cutting-edge thought and uses mindful noting to label it as thinking, can that simple interruption get in the way of the thought coming to life? Another great question. And um, I don't have a definitive answer. I'm just going to give you based on my own personal experience, which is the safest ground from which to answer all of these questions, I think. This is a concern I hear a lot from, especially from creative people that, uh, so you're meditating and you get a great idea and you're supposed to sort of non-judgmentally note it as thinking and not so get so sucked up in, in the thought itself. Are you in some ways, as, uh, you know, uh, shooting yourself in the foot because, you know, this may be the idea uh, that is whatever, going to make you a million bucks or invent some, you know, something. Um my experience, no. That So it is definitely true that when you get into meditation, for me at least, that uh, when you're meditating and you're turning down the volume somewhat, depending on the day, somewhat on your habitual thought processes, that new and different ideas can emerge. And uh, so it's not uncommon for me to be sitting there in meditation and like, some great idea comes up and I get into the spiral that um, I'm sure will be familiar to anybody listening who's meditated of, wait, do we, should I write this down? Am I going to lose it? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, but then uh, what I've learned how to do over time is just uh, trust that if it's truly a good idea, it will still be there when I stop meditating. So long way of saying in my experience, uh, it's it is not detrimental to the thinking process, to the ideation process to the create creative process to have creative thoughts during a meditation session and to try to simply be mindful of them rather than to get sucked into them and keep going with it. But I also think, you know, look, it, you're not breaking some sacred law if you have what you believe is a truly genius idea and you decide to open your eyes, get up and write it down. So what? Go, go for it. Um, I have, I have found um, many times that I'm, for example, I've looked back at notes after meditation retreats where I've thought that I was, you know, solving the world's problems and, and <laughs> often my thoughts weren't as good as I thought they were in the moment. So that's another uh, delight that may be waiting for you as well in the future. Um, all right. Two great questions. Uh, I, I think we're going to try to do this every week. I mean, I, I could live to regret having said that. And maybe we won't. But my, our, our current thinking is that we're going to try to take a question or two every week because it's really cool. So here's the number if you want to call in. 646 646- 8838326 and we'll put it in the show notes and I'll I'll put it all over social media so and we'll say it in future weeks so we'll have plenty of opportunities here. Uh, thank you for those questions and all right let's get to our guest. So our guest this week is incredibly smart and uh, has really made an impact in the world. I wish I was smart enough to describe with some accuracy exactly how he's made impact. So I will do it in, in probably factual in factually inaccurate ways, uh, but then when he gets to talk, he'll say it correctly. But his name is Brad Katsuyama. Um, he's uh, he he has he is the focus of a huge book uh, called Flash Boys by Michael Lewis, who's written all these amazing books about the business world. Uh, Michael Lewis has, uh, and one of his most recent books was called Flash Boys. And Brad w- is the protagonist. And he, after the book came out, he was on on, on sixty Minutes. Brad was, um, and he was a. Uh, and I, this is where I'm going to get into you know dicey territory in terms of, of describing this factually. But he was in the he was a financial services executive, basically involved in Wall Street uh, stuff, uh, which is not a technical term. Um, and uh, saw some saw some structural aspects to trading that he thought was unfair to the rest of us. And he not only uh, blew the whistle on it, uh, but decided to um, create uh, an alternative. So um, that's about as much as I can say without actually losing the thread. But suffice it to say, when he tells the story, it's quite riveting. Riveting enough for Michael Lewis to write a whole mega best-selling book about it. So trust me. Uh, he's also a meditator, and which is useful because his life continues to be extremely <laughs> stressful. Uh, so here we go. Here's Brad Katsuyama. Thanks for doing this, man. Thanks for having me. Nice to see you. Yeah, good to see you. This is the first time I've seen you without like a big plate of fries between us or something like that. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so uh, how did you, how and when and where did you start meditating? So uh, in 2012, uh, so 2004, I, I'm in New York City and I'm working as a trader at the Royal Bank of Canada. 
and started to get these like headaches. And so I go to the doctor and it turns out my blood pressure is out of control. And uh, it was the first time in my life that I'd ever had high blood pressure. And so he gave me this list of things to do and stop drinking coffee and cut out salt, et cetera, et cetera. And I tried for eight years to manage it in a variety of different ways and working out and doing this and doing that. And funnily enough, in 2012, I, I quit my job at RBC to start IEX, which is a company that you know I now work at. And I never had more risk in my life, personally, professionally. You're going from making you know good money to nothing. My second son was just born, and my blood pressure plummeted to normal levels after quitting. Mm. And it, it was the first time to me that you know I think I. I I got a good understanding. I can do all of these things to try to manage my blood pressure, but psychologically, the effect of leaving one company and kind of starting fresh um, had a profound impact on on my blood pressure. And it became this litmus test of kind of like psychological well-being. And so then I started to read about, you know, a variety of different books and, and um, came to this point where, you know, meditation became this recurring theme of like, you know, how to try to center yourself and how to kind of refocus. And so like kind of the whole the whole concept of like mindfulness became something that I kind of dove into. And, you know, pretty much since 2012 on and off and probably more significantly in, that, in the last few years, you know, I've been trying to meditate daily. It doesn't always happen, to be honest, but I try to do it. Um, and it's had a pretty big impact on, you know, the way I the way I interact with people, the way I interact at work, the way I interact with my family, and it's become this kind of like, you know, place for me to to reset, and it's been it's been really helpful. What kind of meditation are you doing? Where do you do it? Um, how long? Yeah, so um, I'm at. This is probably shameful to say, but I'm at 12 minutes. That's good. Uh, Man, that's not shameful. Okay, this yeah. is a safe place. <laughs> so I, my one of my new mottos is yeah. one minute counts. Right. Uh, so yeah, so I'm at 12. Um, so you're doing 12 times my minimum, just right. so you know. Okay, yeah, so that I feel good about that. <laughs> I'll do it on the trains coming home from work. So I, we moved to Connecticut, and so I found that when I'm on the train coming home, it, you need to kind of like create a routine. Um, so I run in the mornings before going to work, um, which is in a weird way another form of meditating. It's just trying to recenter yourself mm-hmm. in, in a different way. And so on the way home, I kind of want to leave work at work and – be present for my family, and so I'll, I'll meditate on the way home, um, and on the way to the airport, always, on the way home from the airport, always, and I, I fly a lot, and so I just try to pick these places where I can, you know, consistently do it, um, and, you know, I've, I've lived in uh, Connecticut for two years, I've, n- I've never missed a train ride, I've never missed a, a ride to or from the airport, and uh, I just really kind of try to focus on, on those times, and, and it's it's been helpful. It's It's hard... My mind goes a million miles an hour, as I'm sure a lot of people's minds do, and I find that it's it's still hard, it's still challenging, um, but it's had a pretty big impact. And and again, my I'm able to kind of in a weird way regulate my blood pressure um, by doing it. Because you're not, I mean, you talk about the challenge of the voices are coming and all this other stuff. Yeah. Your mind's going a million. But it's it, there; those thoughts are less sticky after a while because you learn through meditation not to take them as seriously, and that I believe is part of the mechanism for lowering your blood pressure and lowering your stress overall. In my experience, total. And, and what's funny too is that your body reacts to things differently than your mind does, or your mind believes it's reacting. And that that was kind of the big connection for me is this idea that I don't feel stressed, but my body is telling me something dramatically different. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I feel like meditation was this point where kind of like mind and body became a little bit more aligned. Yep. Um, because there's a lot of people out there that just, I don't feel stressed, so I must not be stressed. And I don't necessarily think that's the case because your body does. And at the end of the day, I mean, that's that's the litmus test for whether this situation is, um, you know, you know how you're reacting. This It's your body. Yeah. Your mind can fool you in all sorts of things. So. I've I've uh, I've. I've said this. I've told this story before. Actually, in my first book, the I had an undiagnosed depression. I, I was feeling awful, just awful. I couldn't get out of bed. I felt like feverish, and months of this. And I got tested for everything. You know, 
everything, dengue, fever, you name it. And I had them test to see if I had a gas leak in my apartment. Right. And then I remember saying to my best friend at the time, this, this woman, Regina, still a really close friend of mine, I remember I said, I think I might have to admit at some point that I'm crazy, which is a flippant way of saying like something else was going on. Mm-hmm. And ultimately I went to a, uh, a doctor who was like, oh, you're depressed. And I, you know, just naming it, you know, helped me figure it out. But the body knows, yep. even though the mind's in denial. It's a really yep. crazy thing. Absolutely. It, it's, you know, it it's just one of these things where um, the more you lean into it, the more you realize that, you know, this is a, there is a connection between mind and body. And, and you can fool yourself into thinking nothing's wrong. And I think, uh, you know, w- another interesting part is like when you focus on your breath and really kind of nothing else you start to realize trigger points about like, oh, I clench my jaw or I yeah. do this. And it yeah. becomes so habitual that it almost becomes commonplace that your jaw is in this constant state of tension. And it's only when you like release it, you, you realize. So I think uh, it's been helpful also to kind of like find these trigger points that I have. Um, so even if I'm not meditating, I can immediately like say, okay, look, focus on my jaw and be like, holy yep. crap, yeah. I'm really like. Or my shoulders. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it's this so funny because that mind body connection sounds so highfalutin and new agey, but and it's so it's almost like somewhat embarrassing to talk about it, right. but but it's undeniable. I mean, the thing there's a reason why a lot of scientists are interested in this because it is a massive, massive and powerful phenomenon. Yes. Um, but but just on a nitty gritty level, when those for those twelve minutes, what are you doing in your mind? What kind of meditation? It's, I don't have like a chant. It's not transcendental. It's, it's, I'm focusing solely on my breath. And the feeling of your yeah, breath coming in. Feeling of the breath out. in and out. And it's, it's mindfulness in the way that, like, when I have thoughts, I let them pass and I try to focus on, you know, different areas that, that, you know, feel tense. Um, and I'm really just trying to quiet my brain down. You know, I, it's, it's, you know, being kind of an entrepreneur and working in a, you know, in a company, we, we're a stock exchange and every day is different. And, it's you know we're we're challenging the establishment so there's a lot of angry people and there's a lot of controversy and i really just focus on quieting my brain down because you know we have i have three young kids seven um brandon seven rylan's five and emmy is two it's very hard to shift from you know being the ceo of this company to being at home as a as a dad and husband and i find that meditation let me bridge that gap doesn't always work Unfortunately, but it well, works. You're in a place but it works ten, a lot. You're in a place called Ten Percent Happier, so it's not always working. <laughs> this yeah. is again a safe place for you, my man. That's right. That's so, right. So I yeah. want to get deeply into the tumult in your workplace because it's it is fascinating. But let me ask a question about your practice. Sure. So I want to. I'm going to issue a caveat before I ask this question. You, this is like you're you're with a, an unlicensed surgeon right now because <laughs> yeah. I am not a meditation teacher, but I just want to, I'm just, you said a few things that just got me, made me curious. Sure. Um, do you, as I do struggle with, cause you said it t- before, like it's, a, it's, it's tough. My mind's going a million, uh, yeah. you know, and, uh, and I'm trying to quiet it down. Do you find that there's a certain kind of subtle antagonism toward the thinking and that you're kind of beating yourself up a little bit when you get lost or is, are you truly letting it go in a, a seamless no, way? No, no, it's a, it's a struggle. It, it is a, it's some days easier than others, but it is a constant struggle. Although I never could have done this ever two or three years ago, four years. Like I just never could have, like when I first tried it, it was almost a joke where I'd be like checking my phone. I feel like it's five <laughs> minutes. It's been 45 <laughs> seconds, like that kind of thing. <laughs> Um, so, but it does, it, it, it feels like a struggle. It's been good. Like, you know, I, the, I, I like the, the app, the 10% happier app, Joseph Goldstein, it's kind of like got this soothing way about him and it's kind of, it's okay. It's like, you know, just go back, start back at the beginning. Yes. Yes. This isn't like business where you make a mistake and there are monetary consequences. That's right. That's right. This is the, the, it's so hard for people like me and you type a strivers to get our heads around the fact that you can't win at meditation (laughs) no right right exactly and i think so it's it's been helpful to be even just the idea that it's okay just start from the beginning just that simple thought gives you something else to focus on other than saying i suck at meditating yes um so that's that's been helpful so I have to say, and I think this will be reassuring, I've been meditating for coming on nine years, and I literally do ten times the amount of daily meditation yeah. that you do. 
literally 10 times, 120 right. minutes. <laughs> and um, I struggle mightily to this day right. with what you're describing. And right. But in in part and parcel of your description was the solution was the was the illustration of uh of the success that you've achieved you started when you started you were checking your uh phone and yeah. you're seeing it's still 45 seconds in yeah. now you make it through 12 minutes and it's not a big deal it may be harder it's still yeah. hard but that is a huge that's quantum leap and right. that just shows you that the mind slash brain is trainable and you are doing it right and i'll just give you one i don't know if this will be useful um one technique that was taught to me recently that I uh, found that I found to be incredibly useful, mm-hmm. uh, and the first I I will say that the first time somebody mentioned it to me, I thought it was stupid. Yeah. So you may think it's stupid, <laughs> but let me just say it. Sure. Uh, and I actually go into great. I have a new book coming out soon, and I this story is in the book in a in a big way. Actually, by the time this posts, the book may already be out. It's called Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics, available at fine bookstores everywhere. <laughs> <clears throat> plug now done um uh it, the book is written with this guy jeff warren who's one of my favorite meditation teachers amazing guy and we were we did this cross-country road trip in a big stupid orange bus with 10 percent happier decals on the yeah. side and we went out and met people who yeah. were interested in meditation but not doing it and helped them get over the hump so they could start meditating and but a lot of the time on the bus we just sat around talking about our own meditative practices and he really identified what i identified in you which is Dan, he, he basically started to refer to my meditation practice as Dan's gulag. Yeah. He was like, you're just like, this is a baton death march you're doing in your own head. You're yeah. just killing yourself every time you get lost. Yeah. So he said that he had this thing where he he would notice the various neurotic programs that run in his own mind. Like, there, if you, if you look carefully, you'll see that the voices that pop up run in patterns. There are totally. like five or six voices that come up, and he would name them. He would give them silly names, and yeah. then when he would see them, he would be like, oh, hey. One of his, one of his voices was El Grandioso, which was mm-hmm. this voice that would pop up and tell him how awesome he is. <laughs> and he would be like, oh, what's up, El Grandioso? It's you again. Yeah. Welcome to the party. Yeah. And then move back to the breath. And that created an inner atmosphere that was more forgiving. Okay, so like I said, when he said this to me, I was like, that's dumb, yeah. and uh, I don't want to do it. But I ended up doing it, and now I, I do it. It is a huge part of my practice, and when uh, I have a, one voice uh, I, I call Sammy, which is named after, I don't know if you've ever heard the book, What Makes Sammy Run, which is a book no. about an obnoxious, striving Hollywood agent. Yeah. You know, I notice that I'm like super ambitious thinking about things that I want to do today or what some how I'm going to game something out with my boss or whatever. Next book I'm going to write, some grand plans for taking over the world with 10% happier and I'm like, "Oh, that's Sammy." Right. What's up, man? Yeah. Welcome to the party. Drop it. It it it's not a, I'm not angry at him. I'm not uh, or I'm I'm you can fake it until you make it. You yeah. might be a little angry at him yeah. and that's fine, but you're you're trying to train yourself not to whip your back every time you get lost so i right. just said a lot but i don't know if any of that makes any no, sense it, 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 you know it, the advice is great because um the voices are consistent they actually like they are like especially when you do it frequently enough there's there's like a few of them and it's always the same relative kind of like theme so they almost like come out of certain parts of your brain so like yeah. absolutely like there's a there's a recognition that that it's there for me it's anger uh, impatience, striving, planning, um, and desire. You yeah. know, it's like the, 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 and it's not complicated. The other thing that's humbling about it is like, yeah, I'm boring. Right. I thought I was like such an interesting person, but I'm really not. It's just right. the same crap <laughs> all the time, uh, which is actually useful in a humbling yeah. way. All right. Anyway, let, let's talk about uh, your your professional life, which is like unbelievably interesting. Tell us about Flash Boys. And, and and I guess my first question is the events in Flash Boys, which we should assume nobody knows about. Um, mm-hmm. Were you meditating during that, during all of that? Yeah. Yeah, I was. Okay. Um, and it was, uh, in a way, you know, meditation and running, like, saved me, uh, kept me sane in, in those in those moments. Not necessarily. So when Flash Boys was, was being written, you know, spent a year and a half with, with Michael Lewis um, as he, in a, in a funny way, you know, walked the same path I did several years before and just trying to understand how the stock market works. And when you realize that, you know, the stock market isn't just a bunch of investors transferring capital, you have people who supply capital, investors, 
You have people who need capital, companies. And you have this massive multi-billion dollar apparatus in the middle that are intermediaries that are trying to make that as difficult as possible. Really? I thought they were trying to make it as easy as possible. <laughs> no. no. How, how, do you, uh, how do you extract as, as much rent as you can from, from each party if, if, if you make it simple? So you're super, super popular with the guys who run the New York Stock Exchange, I would imagine, with comments like that. Yeah, yeah no, not popular at all. Uh, what, what's funny is you know, the stock exchanges end up becoming what is enabled – our current market. 50% of the volume plus is, is high-speed traders. Exchanges make more money selling high-speed data and technology. Advantages to certain parties. They make more money doing that than they do from matching buyers and sellers. So in a way, the market's kind of like lost its mind. And uh, Flash Boy's way was a way of highlighting that. And so going through the process of- Wait, wait, wait I'm sorry. I'm going to sure. interrupt you again. Yeah. Let's just, because there, you just said something really important that I think a lot of folks who don't know your story might might not understand. So let's just do it granularly. Sure. So this started when you were at RBC, Royal Bank of Canada, and yep. you noticed something really important and controversial. And that, just yeah. tell me, to walk us through what that was. So so as a trader at, at Royal Bank of Canada, we have trading systems that show us buy orders and sell orders, bids and offers- um, in different stocks. So if I, you know, I, I was trading on behalf of mutual funds or pension funds, um, and they'd send me an order and say, we want to buy, you know, 100,000 shares of Microsoft. And I'd, I'd pull up a quote in Microsoft, here are the buyers, here are the sellers, and let's say there's 10,000 shares offered to sell at, I don't know, $75. In 2006, I would type into my system, I want to buy those 10,000 shares, and I'd buy them. But in 2007, I type into my uh, computer, I want to buy 10,000 shares of Microsoft. I try to buy them, and my computer would say, you only bought 4,000, and the stock would trade higher. So now I leave stock to buy. I try to buy 6,000 shares at 7,505. I'd get back 2,000, and the stock would take off on me. So I could never buy or sell what I saw on my screens, and at one point I could. And it kind of drove me nuts um, for a while. And then in 2009, I got lucky. I was running... U.S. trading for RBC, they asked me to run global electronic sales and trading, which is a way of saying I went from managing a group of like human traders to a group of computer programmers and engineers who were building algorithms that my trading team was using. So just a completely different set of, of people. Um, and I, when I went over to manage this group, what I realized was that they actually understood that the stock market is not, you turn on CNBC and you see a bunch of people running around on the floor of the exchange, no trading happens on that floor. The markets are completely electronic. All what is that, a movie set? It's a television studio. Absolutely. All the trading happens in, in data centers out in New Jersey. And so what, what these what these engineers and, and developers, and, and one of the co-founders of, of IX is this guy named Ronan Ryan. Ronan worked for a group of traders called High Frequency Traders. Um, they were building networks to connect the different exchanges. They were buying technology. The exchanges were selling to them to give them the ability to pick up a signal at one exchange and to race me to another exchange to buy shares ahead of me and sell them back to me at a higher price. So essentially what happened was I tried to buy 10,000 shares of Microsoft. Um, let's say there was 2,500 shares at BATS, Direct Edge, NASDAQ, and the New York Stock Exchange, New York Stock Exchange ARCA. Um, so I'm, I sent four orders from RBC out to the market to buy 10,000 shares, 2,500 shares each. My first order gets to BATS, because it's located in Weehawken, New Jersey, right on the other side of the tunnel. So RBC's downtown Manhattan, the fiber optic connections to New Jersey go up the West Side Highway, out the Lincoln Tunnel. I get to BATS first, then I get to Direct Edge and Secaucus, then I get to NASDAQ and Carteret, New Jersey, then I get to the New York Stock Exchange in Mawa, New Jersey. I mean, these are hap this is happening in nanoseconds. So the difference in arriving at BATS to New York Stock Exchange was two milliseconds, two one-thousandth of a second, it's 300 milliseconds to blink your eye. So I thought that was actually fast. Ronan comes to RBC. I hired him there and he said, well, hold on. I just built a network that can get my high-speed trading clients from BATS to New York Stock Exchange in 476 microseconds, which is four times faster than my, me at RBC. And I'm like, how in the world can you do that? And he said, well, we buy faster technology from the exchanges. There's, there's now, you know, they're erecting microwave towers in the roof. You're going through a, a fiber optic cable. So... Basically, they were selling people the ability to pick up information, what I think is instantaneous. I think I'm buying 10,000 shares. It's not instantaneous. It's a series of events, and the exchanges are selling the ability to actually insert high-speed traders into the middle of my trade 
to buy shares ahead of me to sell back to me at a higher price. But that sounds to me, and I'm a, I'm a, I don't know anything. Right. Well, let me see if I can rephrase this, and then I'll tell you what it sounds like to me. So you're, you're, I mean, you're not even Joe Public. You're a, you're a, your guy at a pretty big bank. You're trying to yes. buy shares. Yep. And there are people out there. I guess these, these are the flash boys yep. who are able to see that you're about to order something. They beat you to market, and then they sell it back to you at a higher rate. So They're just so, like weaseling in between all totally. of the, the the purchases. And, and so it's not they. So think of it a different way. Um, I'm trying to buy four tickets to a concert, and there are seats one, two, three, four in row B. I try. They'll sell me seats one and two. But they won't let me buy seats three and four. They'll try to sell them back to me at a higher price. So so they don't know I'm a buyer until I buy from someone. So that's me buying from someone on BATS. Now they know I'm a buyer, and now they're racing. BATS is an exchange. BATS is yeah. an exchange. Yeah. yeah. So they, they, they saw me buy at the first exchange, and they're, they're racing me to exchanges two, three, and four to buy stock ahead of me, to cancel those sell orders, to basically just get in the middle of my trade. And, and it's – This um, is legal? Oddly, yes. Michael Lewis asked the same question. How can, how in the world can this be legal? And I think the challenge is, is that as the market evolved, these traders ended up trading at speeds no one imagined. And the exchanges, in a very weird way, are in this position as, as self-regulatory organizations. They, there's a very high bar to be an exchange. There, there's almost like an honor to be in a national stock exchange. And, and they corrupted themselves because they, they sold people the ability – um, to trade ahead of other people. As long as you're willing to think, think of it a different way. The role of the exchange is like a referee. There's two teams playing. There's a set of rules. My job is to enforce the rules. So a buyer and a seller um, on an exchange are like the two teams. You have the referees in our stock market, the exchanges. They make more money selling things to one of the teams than they actually do from refereeing the game. So if that was happening in the NFL, they, they, they're, the, the refs are selling, they have merchandise, they have this, they're selling nutritional packages. There's, or they're selling turbocharged cleats to the Astros, but not the Dodgers. Absolutely. Yeah. Who Do you think they're neutral? Absolutely not. They want the people buying the turbocharged cleats to win more than they lose, because if they lost more than they won, they'd stop buying the cleats. But, but so is this legal? It is legal, it's, right? It is legal. Nobody's gone to jail over this. Well, there there have been a bunch of fines and, and things like that. Um but it's more about the fact that you didn't disclose the fact that you were selling these things to these other people or you hid the fact that you did this. I think the overall practice is really what we had a problem with. So so part of the idea behind quitting my job at RBC and starting IEX was the idea that what was happening was legal. Um, I could go down and, you know, we could go down and complain in Washington, D.C. and pick it and do a bunch of, you know, stuff or – you can go out and try to build a different kind of stock exchange. Like, and that's, that's what IEX is. That's what IEX, IEX was our, our market response to say, you know what, not every stock exchange has to sell advantages. Not every stock exchange has to favor high-speed traders at the expense of investors. We're going to build an exchange that actually protects investors from certain aspects of high-speed trading. We, we have a speed bump. We slow orders down instead of speeding people up by selling them faster um, You know, technology. We slow people down, and it created – literally a complete maelstrom in the markets people went ballistic in the fact that we tried to actually just do something fair full disclosure my brother my little brother i like to call him my little brother especially <laughs> when he's not here because he's actually taller than me uh matt is an investor in your company um and that's how we know each other yes. um well funnily and, enough yeah and if you have that's even... not how we know each other. well maybe slightly i read the book and then it was only i then i started watching videos online i'm like Dan looks a lot like Matt. So I reached out to Matt and I'm like, is this your, <laughs> is this your brother? Because if so, I want to... You know, what's funny is the, bo- the, the book is the book I give... I've, I've been talking about meditation on and off to a lot of my uh, friends and, and family, but a lot of the books were have, are kind of... I don't want to call them crazy, but different. Maybe a little annoying. 10% Happier was the first book that I felt comfortable recommending to people to kind of experience w- what I feel like I'm experiencing because it... It explained it in a way that makes it okay to be cynical. And I think most people who have never experienced meditation are naturally cynical. And so you have to almost embrace the cynicism to get someone to a point of, of appreciating. Right. Um, I appreciate that. So I know 
So basically, I, I sought you out through him, but he, he yeah. Uh, so I see. That, I see. that was the, yeah. Well, if you have any embarrassing stories about him at any point, feel free to share. Cause <laughs> no, I he's like, great. I like making fun of Matt. <laughs> he is, by the way, the secret, he and my wife are the secret, my secret weapons. They basically are my primary editors on everything I do. Right. Um, and Matt was, Matt came up with many of the best ideas that went into 10% Happier. And if he ever asked me to repeat that, I won't. Um, <laughs> so, so anyway, so that uh, all out of the way, um, you say it created a maelstrom in the marketplace. W- w- I, uh, what what was the reaction? Because you decided to do a stock exchange the way you thought it was ethical to do. Has, is it working? And, and are people mad at you? Yeah. So it's, so it's definitely working. Um, you know, our first day we did 560,000 shares um, you know, a couple million dollars in trading, and our record now we, we've we've had a day that was ten point seven billion dollars uh, of trades happening on IX. So so it's it's gone well. We continue to grow. Um, in the simplest way, if if the playing field is unlevel and you come in and try to level it, anyone who benefited from the unlevel playing field is going to be unhappy about that. Like it's it's kind of that that simple. There's a lot of people who benefited from the system that existed perpetuated the system that existed, made a tremendous billions of dollars off that system. And we came in and said, you know what? There's a lot of unfairness in this system. There's a lot of 401ks and mutual funds and pension funds that are basically bleeding out money they don't even know they're entitled to, to a system that has been set up to essentially disadvantage them. And we're going to change that. Uh, A lot of, not a lot of people, very select companies got very, very, very upset because they make a tremendous amount of money from the system. So New York Stock Exchange... Furious, Nasdaq, etc. Um, and how does that f- fury manifest? Suing you, uh, sl- uh, you know, saying. So I'll give you a good example. So to be an exchange, which we are now, we started as as kind of like a lightly regulated exchange, but uh, we went through a process. Um, it was a two year process to get an exchange license from the SEC. The SEC has to hand you a license to say, you know, you can be a national stock exchange, um, and it led to a very public fight. Because the New York, NASDAQ, et cetera, didn't want us to be an exchange. So they wrote nasty letters to the SEC about IEX. They called us all sorts of names. We've been called, you know, un-American, unfair, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm Canadian, so I didn't take that much offense <laughs> to un-American. But um, so they wrote all sorts of nasty things. NASDAQ threatened to sue the SEC if they approved IEX. So they, they did go to pretty extreme measures. And at the same time, you had... Um, California State teachers and Texas teachers, Capital Group, T. Rowe Price, you had a bunch of like real big investors supporting us. So like anyone that stands back says, hold on a second, these big investors representing millions and millions of people want IEX to be approved and the existing exchanges don't and a bunch of high-speed traders don't? Like that fight set up exactly what the fight is all about. This is about a concentration of power and, and a tr- billions of dollars going to a very small number of people and trying to stop that and trying to redistribute that wealth across all the other people that participate in the stock market. And so they did a lot of things to prevent us from getting approved. And at the end of the day, the SEC made the decision to approve us. But that was a very long and drawn out public fight. Now, the funny part about it is that right after we got approved, the New York Stock Exchange says, you know what? Oh, we're going to take one of our three exchanges and become a speed bump, too. We're going to we're going to slow down one of our three markets, which is, makes absolutely no sense, because the whole point of the speed bump is to say, we're protecting you from all the advantages. We're protecting investors from the advantages they can buy on the other exchanges. So it's almost like you know having a tobacco company and then and then setting up a sub sub company that says, oh, we're going to sell you know kind of anti tobacco patches. Like so, so New York copied us. Um, it hasn't been successful, but it, it just the the level of of irony and the level it's this it's a it's a very odd competition because. They proclaim to do all these great things for the market, but in reality, they're protecting a business that's about rent seeking. Um, if if you if what you're doing is so much better and so much more fair, why isn't everybody trading through you? Because New York Stock Exchange, Nasdaq, and Bats pay two point seven billion dollars a year to brokers to send them orders. So if a pension fund trades through a broker and a broker sends that order to the New York Stock Exchange, the broker gets paid for that, and we don't pay those those kickbacks. And and essentially, they are people get mad when I say the word kickbacks. But if a broker has a client order, sends it to an exchange and gets paid for it, and doesn't give that payment back to the client, I don't know what else to call it, but that's what it is. So there's a payment. So basically, an exchange builds an exchange, 
New York Stock Exchange builds an exchange. They sell all these advantages to high-speed trader. Who in the world would want to trade there? No, nobody would want to trade there. Why would you ever want to do that? Why would you ever want to play against the team with the turbocharged cleats? Well, a broker who's tasked with executing a client order is being paid to send the client into that exchange. Because when the client gets picked off, it broker doesn't have anything to do with it. They get they get the pay, they get the commission from the client, they get the payment from the exchange. The client's got to deal with the fact that they just bought at a price that's, you know, not the right price. If they were here, if if the representatives from Nasdaq and NYSE were in the room, how would they refute what you're saying? Or they is would it say, not refutable? We pay people to provide liquidity. You know, liquidity is one of those words that you say and just makes everything okay. Uh, they'll say we pay people to provide liquidity. What is, I don't even know. I don't even know what liquidity means in this context. Well, that's why they say it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard thing to you know. It, it's they they'll they'll say uh, the technology and data we sell is available to anyone, but it's tens of millions of dollars. So so you can so what that's technically a true statement. Are you and I going to go out there and is a pension fund of Missouri going to go out there and spend tens of millions of dollars on equipment from the so it's kind of but anyone can buy it. It, It's a fair market because anyone can buy this high speed data and technology. We pay people rebates. They call them rebates to provide liquidity on our market. Uh, so it's, you know, there's, there's industry buzzwords that, you know, people use. And, 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 and honestly, before IEX launched as an exchange, every single exchange paid rebates, right? Market data and technology is, is the, is a, a huge revenue source for all of these exchanges. So we're just, we're a different kind of exchange. So, um, you know, but yeah, it's, it's very hard to refute in English. So I think you use the word fight and, and, and I think, People will hear the passion in your voice, right? Because um, you're engaged in a fight, and it's clear <laughs> yeah. to you, me uh, sitting here and uh, having had private conversations with you uh, before that you're really you're really worked up about this. And I just wonder how do you stop this from inf- just bleeding into every aspect of your life, like just dominating your thoughts when maybe you want to be, you know, just focusing on your kids or talking to your wife yeah. or whatever. Like, hey, this sounds so all engrossing. Yeah, it's it's so meditation and running are my two big outlets and and they force in a way introspection. I think you have to at the end of the day, we're in this huge fight um, and we're running a marathon. And sometimes my sometimes my brain wants to sprint um, and sometimes I want to pass the next water station. But like in reality, I realize that this is a this is a long battle and um by having these moments of, of introspection, you realize that in order to win, and we fully intend on winning, um, you have to reprioritize, you know, your life in a way that can let you make it to the finish line. Did, did your wife ever say to you, dude, stop talking about this, or I can tell you're thinking about it, ease up? She she does. She's a very good – she she can tell just by my the, the my face – what mode I'm in. Um, and I think she does a very good job of kind of like keeping, you know, it normal. Um, meditation has helped a lot in being able to switch from, you know, kind of like work mode to home mode. Um, as my kids get older, there's a different level of, of engagement than when they were, when they were babies that requires me to, understand that the influence I have on them and the mannerisms they pick up and and the way that I, I interact with them is, is has a profound impact on who they're going to end up being as, as people. And I think that – so I, I take it – I take home life as almost as seriously as I take work because it takes that amount of seriousness to like not let this yeah. impact yeah. your life. Um, but again, it's – it's if I stopped running, if I stopped meditating, I, I might go crazy. Uh, cause I, I need these moments to like center myself. It's, it's just like so critical. And how's it going? I mean, uh, do you, I've gotten updates from you over the years, but you know, how, right now, as we sit here right now, how's this, how's it going? This, this quest you're on? It, it's going well. Um, you know, we just got approval by the SEC to now list companies on our exchange. We got approval to be an exchange, um, 
listing a company is, you know, Microsoft lists on NASDAQ, IBM lists on the New York Stock Exchange. And Even that though just, they trade elsewhere. They, they trade everywhere. Yeah. And that just means that they open and close on those markets, but there's a huge honor in cachet. being- yeah, yeah, cachet. Like NASDAQ and New York are, are talked about in a different way because they have listings. Um, we just got approval to do that. And so, you know, there's a group of companies and that we're going to move over. And I just, again, think that we're bringing a different type of model to the market. This has been a 50-year-old duopoly for New York and NASDAQ, and now we're a new entrant. And I think it's just super exciting. So things are going well. Market share is growing. Companies doing well. We're profitable. And now we have this other business line that we can start to to kind of really, um, you know, really push. And so I think all of that is is great. And, and you know, being able to, in a way, kind of control our own destiny at IX, the stresses that I have... I think one of the greatest stresses I had working at a big company is that a lot of things that I was concerned about, I couldn't con- I couldn't control. And I think that's probably one of the most stressful feelings that you can ever have is that I can't affect this outcome. No matter what I do, this decision is getting made or no matter what happens. this. And I think part of why my blood pressure dropped so much when I left is that this burden of like, seeing this path and knowing that I don't know if we should be doing this, but I can't, I just can't do anything. Um, you know, it just, it was lifted. Yeah. But yet now you have a new burden, which is you have to make decisions to be held accountable for them. Uh, th- so that burden to me is a different kind of burden, but I think individually it's less stressful than just being helpless. Being Feeling helpless is, is a, is a, is a terrible feeling. And I feel like, although there are stresses of, of what we do, I don't feel helpless every day I get up and I know that I can do things, even if it's a much longer term outcome, I can do things today that can affect the course of, of, you know, our company's, you know, trajectory. And um, sometimes when you work at a big company, it's very, very hard to feel, feel like that. Um, And so I think that it's, it's, it's just trying to manage it in a different way and, and trying to be introspective and have context about where am I, what am I doing? Mindfulness is just an incredible, like, practice because you know sometimes you just have to kind of be in the moment and and recognize you know the situation that you're in and be appreciative of the fact that you know this is this is the hand you've been dealt and i i do think i do think there, there's a lot of stress in our job it's never i've never been a controversial person the funniest thing about all of this is that i spend my entire life trying to get along with people like there are <laughs> very few people that say that this brad i don't like him before flash boys um it's just you know, why make life more difficult on yourself? But now, obviously, it's it's controversial, and there's a lot of people that don't like me. And how do you know that? Do they actually say, I don't like you? or they, Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where where would you meet somebody who's going to say that to you? At a congressional hearing where you're testifying or something like that? Yeah, sometimes it, it's, it's you know, it'll be, you know, in D.C., or it'll be at an industry event, or it'll be, you know, here or there, or you hear from other people, all oh, these people hate you. Or this, it's just, it's, it, it, in a way, it, it you know... Um, if no one disliked what we were doing, I would question what we're doing. Yeah, <laughs> you're you're trying to disrupt. Yeah, and I and I think uh, you know, although it's not, I, I don't, I don't know if I would have ever said at the time, rewind the clock fifteen years. This is what I want to be doing with my life. Uh, this just happened to be the hand I was dealt, and and I and I played the cards to the best of my ability, um, and and I think that. In a way, you know what I what I really liked about Flash Boys is that Michael Lewis did not turn me into this character that's larger than life. That was this rebel that took on the system. Like he painted me exactly as I am. I, I was just a guy in a certain place, faced with a certain set of decisions that made decisions that I think a lot of people would have made in my in my situation. It, this is you've been a great interviewee what are there things that i should have asked you that i didn't areas that you wanted to explore that that you feel like i failed to guide us into no i mean i i do think it's you know what's interesting is is that a lot of people think that you know meditation or even mindfulness is about you know you might you you'll lose your edge Mm -hmm. or you'll become soft um and in a way it's it's I don't want to say it's the opposite because you can be direct but not aggressive. You could be, um, you know, you can be. It, it provides me with a, a level of clarity 
that I think I wouldn't otherwise have if I didn't do it. Have you ever had moments where you think maybe I'm losing my edge a little bit? Or do you have so much edge that this is just taking a, a, a little bit of edge off of it? No, I, I, I think, uh, especially kind of in my job now, I feel like I can recognize when I'm not meditating enough or I'm not getting, I'm not getting that part of what I need because my, my thinking gets cloudy and my, you know, my decision making starts to lapse or I'm reacting more than I want to. And, and I got to, you know, kind of like refocus. So I feel like if anything now, I'll notice moments where I lack focus and clarity rather than like, oh, I just meditated and I feel soft. It's it's almost, funnily enough, it's almost, it's almost the opposite. When you can think very clearly and you'll, you'll be more decisive. Um, You'll, you'll have more conviction. Um, And that to me, decisiveness and conviction are kind of the opposite of soft. Yeah. Um, But I do think that you know, if anyone feels that, you know, mindfulness and meditation is, is kind of cr- what, what's interesting is that I think it's just starting to get into. And again, your book, your book probably, you know, hits this area. A lot of people that were focused on, on meditation would have come from a certain kind of walk of life and it was easier for them to embrace it. And I think that, you know, the industries that we come from are a little bit different and it, there's more type A's that are attracted to it and it's more driven and it's more like competitive. And I feel like it's just starting to kind of break in um, to that realm. You know, I have uh, an executive coach I work with, Kate Bednarski, and, you know, she worked at Nike. She had all she had this great like kind of like business resume. I started working with her and it was all about mindfulness. We hardly ever talked about about work. Um, and I have her working with my executive team. And there, it's the people I never would have thought would have responded to this type of coaching are absolutely loving it, and and the changes are extremely positive. You know, it's 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 not a sign of weakness whatsoever to think that this is the type of you know you know uh, skill set that you know hard charging type A's should think about developing. It's almost the opposite. Yeah. No, I mean, look, you're preaching to the to the one-man choir over here. Absolutely. I agree. And I, you're a great poster boy for the point I'm always trying to make about, hey, this is not does not mean you're going to lose your edge. If you're more focused and less yanked around by your emotion, you have more edge. And it may be edge without edginess. You know, you're, you're, yeah. you can uh, communicate more clearly without carrying, you know, the fight you have with your wife over into this conversation and being mean to people. You know, they're, they're, it's, it's, a, it's a cleaner, calmer, saner way to operate in my view yeah, absolutely and, and in today's day and age like with you know heightened sensitivity it's like decisiveness is important and and and, and doing that in a in a consistent and and clear way you know you know in the in you know 10 or 15 years ago people could you know blow up and have volatile outbursts and be smashing things and like that that happened a lot in in finance i don't know if that per- persona can exist in today's world um, all it takes is one social media post and that person yeah. probably is out of yeah. a job. So it's kind of like, and millennials don't put up with that stuff. I mean, they don't, they really don't like yeah, it. I mean, the, Gen X, I, I, where are, are you a millennial? I'm 78. I'm okay. probably okay. Gen yeah. X. Yeah. 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 I mean, like my generation, the, the, the role models that I had, they were losing their tempers a lot, you know, yeah. like in this building here at ABC, right. nobody who's still here, but like that does not fly now. No, no. And if it did, it'd be it'd be videoed and it'd be yes. put on. Yes. <laughs> it'd be over quickly. So I think this is such a good practice to say you can you can have all these things, you can have that edge and you can have that level of aggression, but try to focus. And again, I'm not perfect. I was a trader, so like I'm 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 always working on. I'm I overreact a lot, but I I have an understanding of that and that I can be better because I've had the ability to step back to kind of have that introspection, to be critical without beating myself up. I just know that that's something I got to work on, but... Name that voice. Yeah. Name the overreacting <laughs> voice and, yeah. and like, went in and greet him or her um, warmly and and so that you're not so caught... Because what we end up doing is we see, you know, I, I was at a sort of cultish adolescent stage in my meditation where I was seeing the arising of the voices that, that are problematic for me and, in, and so that's the first step to see it. But I was then freaking out about the fact that I've seen it. It's a, really for you. It's like, you know, you 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 know, your wiring, which is that you tend to overreact to stimuli. Mm-hmm. Um, 
But that's cool. Like, you can't help that. That's not your fault. That's right. the way you were made. And yeah. But then the thing is, can you see it happening? And then can you let it pass without freaking out about it? And that yeah. is the ninja move of this whole game. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I for, I don't know how many, nine years, I was trained to react. Yeah. I was a trader. Yeah. And now I'm trying to untrain myself by, by in, in a way, by meditating. Like, it, yeah. it is a learned skill. Um, yeah. And I think, again, it's... It's, you know, after talking, I should do it for more than 12 minutes. This, this conversation has just convinced me to up my minutes. But. Well, I, 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 want, I want to be careful about that because hum, uh, I learned – the reason why I wrote this most recent book, the, the, so, um, just as a little backstory. So I, you know what 10% Happier is, but I wrote that book because I – first of all, I didn't think I was going to read it. But I thought that what if I had any value to add was because I have no – nothing original to say about meditation. But if I had any value to add, it was that I could talk about it using the F word and listen some humor and, right. and talk about it from perspective of an ambitious person. And I was under this naive assumption that, okay, well, anybody who reads this, once I make a logical case, they'll start to meditate. Right. That was a stupid assumption. <laughs> Actually, as it turns out, habit formation right. is really, really, really difficult. And, and you even said it right back to the beginning of this conversation. You're like, I do 12 minutes most days, not every day. And there's a little bit of guilt creeping into your voice. Yeah. So I wrote this the the most recent book that's uh, um, called Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics, and and it's a the the point was to help figure out what are the obstacles standing yeah. in the way of of doing this habit of establishing this habit that's manifestly really good for you, and I, I you know you should you definitely should not bite off more than you can chew, which right. could set up a guilt spiral that would kill the whole thing. That's right. 12 minutes is working for you. My inclination is to say, if you're going to go up, go up very slowly and yeah. gradually and, and forgive yourself. Well, let me just say this. With the one thing I learned, I had to do a lot of research into behavior change, mm -hmm. human behavior change. And um, the biggest lesson that shown through for me was that um, experimentation and the willingness to experiment and fail and start again, just mm -hmm. the way we do on the cushion, by the way, is the magic, the magic of yeah. behavior change. So like for you, maybe you say, you know, I'm going to go to 14 minutes, try yeah. it. And maybe that's really good, but maybe you get to 20 minutes and it falls off. So it's like, it's just tight, tight trading all the time. Yeah. The, the failure aspect and then not wanting to return it, that's a real phenomenon. Yes. It's like, you know, that is, yeah. so I think what, what's funny about where I got on 12 is that now especially so I've, I've been taking this train for over two years when i get on the train i have no signal like i can't do anything <laughs> so it's it, it became the perfect corridor yeah to just like mentally just realize that i can shut down yeah and i i found like that gave me the consistency um that i needed and i think it's uh consistency is 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 key king Actually, yeah. it's consistency is you need to get you need. And again, I've just learned all of this and having written about it, uh, I'm, I'm kind of steeped in it now. But you need to get the practice anchored into your life in a consistent yeah. fashion, which you have done. And then you can once you've done that, actually, you are way down the, the track on this. Once you've done that, you can experiment with the dosage. Right. Um, right. So maybe you should. But I just don't want you to f do it with a sense of like, oh, man, I'm screwing up. because I'm not doing more. <laughs> um, yeah. This has been a pleasure. You were just you were great. Um, if people want to learn more about you, obviously they can um, they can uh, check out uh, Flash Boys. Is yep. there anything you have a website, a Twitter handle, anything else people should yeah, check out? IXTrading dot com is a website. Yeah, we were IX is on you know Instagram, Twitter, and all that stuff. Um, yeah, it's it's we're out there. Um, you know, Flash Boys was helpful, but if people want to find us, we're definitely out there. Awesome, thank you. Great, thank Appreciate you. It. Okay, that does it for another edition of the 10% Happier Podcast. If you liked it, please take a minute to subscribe, rate us. Also, if you want to suggest topics you think we should cover or guests that we should bring in, hit me up on Twitter, at Dan B. Harris. Importantly, I want to thank uh, the people who produce this podcast, Lauren Efron, Josh Cohan, and the rest of the folks here at ABC who helped make this thing possible. We have tons of other podcasts. You can check them out at abcnewspodcasts.com. I'll talk to you next Wednesday. <laughs>